push button, future real life, no undo. I live in the moment, no undo. I woke up one night, I came to the light, let the sun do. Now I'm turned up, I do it how I want to. I'm all off face, like house and jungle. They all synthesize, but they ain't quite techno. Living in the past and they can't quite let go. Sort of like Alice, had to travel down the rabbit hole. Mind load out, sort of like a catacomb. I'm all the way there, can't remember how to get home. Even when it's hard shit, I still gotta press on. Even with the lights of the media and press on. The flashing lights, they come with the profession. That is not me, that is a perception. First, let me level with you, then let me ascend. If we ain't talking money, what are we discussing? <laughs> Trying to discern between good and bad spirits can be rather bewitching. See, switching channels, local programming got me stitching my moral fabric like moral patterns, but more elaborate. 
Deeper than the web of lies, the media fabricates. The media fabricates. Immediate gratification, trading love for status spikes like drugs on Insta hype times. Things for Insta likes and memes, having dreams of mainstream spotlights. Some things just ain't right. Must have went left when what we inhaled. Ain't as important as J and M hell. Heaven ain't high enough when they spread with chemtrails. Failing to see a way out is no excuse not to make one. In the failing light of the moon at night. Still praying to see that day come. episode of Think New, and uh, appreciate everybody out there that's joining us today, this evening, tonight. I got a, a special guest on tonight, one of my favorite people in the world. Um, like, you know, like I always say, I don't like to give too much uh you know, backgrounds and all of that kind of stuff. I like for the person to be able to speak for themselves and, and you know, it's much more interesting when the person says it themselves. Um, plus, you know, I can't never really capture the, the everything. I can only give you my perspective on it. But um, tonight uh, we have a guest on. It's going to be a, uh, I'm not sure which name, to call her by, uh, I call her mostly by the name of Dee Dee, you know what I mean, um, she's definitely, uh, family to me, um, and so I call her Dee Dee, but her name is, uh, Dee Dee Hibbler, and for those who don't know who she is, she's a, uh, music industry professional, um, I kind of learned mostly all the things I know business-wise about music from her. Um, she has a brief background, um, I think probably A&R director is the best title to describe her by, um, she was the A&R director for the Face Records, you know, um, during their heyday, you know, during the height, she also 
um, work, you know, very closely with organized noise on the business side is for that. Um, I think she did A&R administration for them. She also was like president of Purple Ribbon. Um, she had her own company for more than a decade, like like more than two decades probably, um, Murray Media Music Group. And now she's into all kinds of things, health and wellness and education. She was on the Grammy board for um, um, the Southeastern region. Um, just just a lot of stuff. She her her rep, it goes deep. So I don't even really, you know, want to do it any injustice by trying to describe it. But um, I'm going to give her a call in a minute, try and get her online, see if we could pick her brain a little bit, find out, you know, how she got into the business and how she sees things now and, and different stuff like that. Just chop it up and, uh, you know, hopefully we get some good information for everybody and something we can all, you know, grow on. So, without further ado, let's see what we can do about that here. I gotta bear with me. All this stuff is still new to me. I'm getting used to it. I gotta pull up, pull up my apps and stuff like that. But, um, and I don't know if y'all follow, you know, hip hop like I do and battle rap and stuff like that man but I, I like to um you know send my prayers out for um 40 cow man if, if y'all know who 40 cow is from dipset the battle rap community and everything man his daughter was uh kidnapped and I don't I don't know all the details but you know it, it's not sounding good so I would definitely like to send my condolences Get Didi in here real quick. I also didn't mention that Didi is also the infamous Peaches from the Outcast records. So, um, yeah, I think that's dope as well. You know what I mean? We're going to find out more about that. Yourself. I'm doing good. That's what's up. Chilling. Well, welcome to the show. Think new. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, brother. With Miss du with Miss Dee Dee Hibbler. Thank you. That's what's up. I'm trying to get you in in the uh, into this live real quick. Okay, here we go. Bam. We in. Now we in there. Welcome. All right, Ken. What's up? <laughs> Not much. What's going on, Dee Dee? Chilling on this Friday evening. I heard that. How you been <laughs> doing lately? I've been doing real good, thank you. Yeah. How about yourself? Oh, cool then. I can't complain. Good. Well, I'm glad you had time to come on to the show. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, yeah. Most definitely. So, like, I guess to get, because it's a new show I'm doing. And okay. just to give you a background on what it's about and everything, it's um it's called Think New. Okay. And basically, it's just like um it's a show geared at taking um things that you know like entertainment and um, discussions and stuff that we have in our communities and things like that, and try to bring new perspectives to it. Um, try to like um give people insights that they may not know, like um, break down some of the myths and and things like that. You know what I mean? Okay. So um, I just wanted to have you come on the show so, you know, maybe we could talk about some of the things that you've done in the industry and some of the real, you know, like insider stuff. Like what's it really like to be in the industry? What's the business side really like? And what, yeah. you know, 
the things that we sort of miss when we're just looking at videos on TV. You know, okay. I mean, like the work that goes into it and stuff like that. Okay. So, um, I guess um, if you could, I gave a little bit of background just now, like when I intro the show um, on who you are and things like that. But I, I try to leave it loose because I like for the guests to be able to speak for themselves because I could never say it like you could. Okay. Well, I consider myself an entertainment industry professional. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been doing in the, professionally working in the entertainment field since 1985. Word. Which, although I'm 26, you know, yeah, math. Yeah, that you know, new you math. start young. <laughs> it's, it's, that, it's that think new math. It, it don't add up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I started in radio, uh-huh. you know, early, early in my career. Uh-huh. Um, and I, in retail, I, I actually started in retail uh-huh. selling records. And then um, I got into radio the radio game, which is something that I loved. Um, I went to college in Savannah at Savannah State, and I, I majored in radio and television broadcasting. Nice. I thought I wanted to be a news anchor. Uh, <laughs> didn't quite go you know, that way for you. <laughs> no, it didn't go that way for me, but, you know, it was cool. I really wanted to be like the weather lady or some shit, you know? <laughs> That's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah, and I, I love meteorology. Like, I really do. Mm. Um, but I, you know, I went to college and I had a, my own radio talk show. I was the news director of the radio station in, in Savannah for for years. Really? And then I came home and worked at. And that was my first job out of college. They actually offered me the job before I graduated as the news director of W E A S E ninety three Savannah. That's hot. Yeah. That's hot. So you said you started off selling records. Mm-hmm. Like in a I record worked store? at tur- I worked at Turtles Records and Tapes. That's some old school shit. Wow, that a lot of people- that's that's classic history. If you're right really there. from Atlanta and yeah. you you know you know about Atlanta, then you know about Turtles Records and Tapes. That was my job in high school. That was my dream job. What? Was to work at Turtles. That's crazy. So that was in Atlanta. That was in Decatur, Camel Road. In Decatur, right across Camel. the street from South Decatur Mall. Yeah, yeah. East Side. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, Decatur so, was greater, and we would sell. I remember the most impactful record that I remember discovering mm-hmm. was Keith Sweat's "Make It Last Forever." Yeah, I remember when that record came out? It was a masterpiece. We hadn't heard anything like that in eight in ever. ever. Facts. <laughs> Facts. Because it was other Prince record. You it know, was Prince. like he was right after what Bobby Brown, right? No, before Bobby Brown, Keith Sweat, Make It Last Forever came out when I was in high school because I remember working at Turtles when that record came out and Bobby Brown came out by himself when I, in the 90s when I was working at Capitol. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Dang, Keith Sweat was before Bobby Brown. I Keith remember Sweat, that Make It Last Forever, you might want to Google the fact, but yeah, I think that record came out maybe like in 1982, 83 or something like that. Yeah, I, I remember that record. It was because that that grew that boom, boom, boom. And he had boom. that sweater on. Mm-hmm, yeah, make it last forever <laughs> with the sleeves pushed up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but he had that sweater on. Yeah. But that was the most that was the most incredible album to me. It just it just really touched me. Outside of you know like Purple Rain, you know we grew up with Prince. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. but that when that Key Sweat. That he was, he started that that nineties R and B kind of thing. Yeah, you know, even though he came out in the eighties, he he kicked off that male R and B thing that Bobby Brown and all of them, you know, like Guy and all of them just kind of slid into. Right, right. You know, so my love was music. Like I love music. I love music. Music has always been a part of my family. Um, my great uncle is a man named Al Hibbler. Mm-hmm. Um, you can Google him. He um sang Unchained Melody. Which was like a number one hit back in the fifties. Yeah, yeah I, I hit seen record. that. I seen that record before. I know I've heard it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Al Hibbler. Yep, that's my great uncle. I look just like him. Wow, <laughs> you can see the resemblance. That's crazy. And our family on his album covers. Yep. I'm but I've always that. loved music. My uncle was uh, into music. Um, when I was in high school, I managed his his band. They his uh dance group. They used to kill talent shows. And then he had a group called the New Breed. 
and um, I was in that little video. So it, it, music has always been in my family. So how um, did you go from the record store into the radio station? From the record store into the radio station, it was a natural progression because um, when I was in college, my job at Turtles transferred me up to Savannah. It was a Turtles up the street from the from the college, uh. so I work at Turtles and over there. But I also got a job working at the radio station that at my college. You know, I started getting into radio. Uh. I knew I wanted to be in radio. I love radio. And um, so I just started working at the radio station. I had a little, a little afternoon, uh, talk a uh, jazz set called Lunchtime Jazz, from twelve to two. For real. And the DJ, yep. And I had my little jazz set at at, at WHCJ. So I just naturally gradu- gravitated toward radio in college. That's and And uh, when I was in college, uh, I I went to the co- to the commercial station that gave me my job. And me and a group of my friends started a a, 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 um, a show called the Savannah State Spotlight mm-hmm. at E93, and it came on Saturdays from like from like ten to twelve or something. I can't remember. And every Saturday, no matter how drunk we got, we used to have to be at that radio station at nine thirty in the morning so that we could start our our little show at ten. <laughs> Did you have a radio name? Just Didi. Yeah, just, just Dee Dee, not, you know, not, not, nothing major. Okay. Yeah, just Dee Dee, yeah. Mm-hmm. But I love radio, and I love music, and I love records, so I went from selling records to playing records on the radio, and then while I was at E93, you know, I would see the record company people come, like the, the music promoters mm-hmm. that were promoting the artists and promoting the records, and I was like, who are these niggas coming, taking people to lunch, and they got the artists with them and stuff, and I was like, I want to do that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, who are these cats? So, that intrigued me. I got to know a couple of the radio guys, Um, mm-hmm. this guy named Charles Gear, who was one of my uh, radio mentors, and another guy named Teddy Aston, mm-hmm. um, who's another one of my radio mentors. Um, and this old, this man, rest his soul, Luther Terry, Mm -hmm. they used to come through, they used to work at like Polydor and Warner and those were in Atlantic and those radio and those record companies and bring their artists. And being that I worked at the radio station, I used to be at all of the concerts. Mm -hmm. So they would take us out to lunch or whatever, give us tickets. And I was like, yeah, I like these cats. So lo and behold, um, after I graduated from college, I worked at E93 for a couple of years and then I moved to Atlanta. And I said I wanted to work at B103. Mm-hmm. And everything I've always kind of set my sights for, it just kind of manifested. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of have a dream it and do it mentality. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's how things for me have always manifested throughout my whole my whole career. I kind of dream it, see it in my head, vision it, and somehow wind up doing it. Just, you know, my actions start moving towards it. So when I moved home, you know, I said, I want to work at B103. Mm-hmm. I was calling up there. They didn't have no job for me. You know, I, I met the program director. His name was um, Mr. Ray Boyd. He, he was like, you know, you you can come up here and volunteer, but, you know, I can't pay you. And I was like, fine. My parents had a had a restaurant at Underground Atlanta. So, mm-hmm. you know, I used to work at the radio station, at, at Underground, in between working at the radio station. Mm-hmm. Um, and I used to catch the bus back and forth and the train to get from, from uh, Ralph McGill and uh, Cortland, where the radio station was at the time, the underground, a couple of blocks up. Mm-hmm. So I did that for a minute, and then finally I got that job at B103. I became the, the, the assistant to the program director. Assistant. And I was, yep, assistant to the program director at B103, and I was the free money lady. I was the lady that gave out your $103 and made you sign that paper what? for you. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> and you know, I never knew that. I never knew you worked at V one hundred and three. I worked at V one hundred and three from nineteen eighty, woo, eight, eighty seven, eighty eight, mm-hmm. to like maybe eighty. I don't know, eighty nine, ninety or something. I don't. I can't remember. It was the eighties. Well, about it, two, it three years. That, huh? Said about two, three years. 
Yeah, for a minute, for a minute, because I graduated from college in 87, mm-hmm. came home 88, 89, probably 89, 90. I, don't, I can't remember. It's all a blur. Those days are a blur, but I did a lot. You know, I, I was 10 years in the game before I met Rico Patton Ray. Right. right. I was I was, I was very much planted in, in the industry. They I was introduced to them because they needed help. Yeah. You know, Ian, Ian Ian actually introduced me to them. I was like, I got these cats. They need some help. Ian Burke, because he worked at LaFace at the time, right? Nah, Ian never worked at LaFace. Ian never, Ian never worked at LaFace. He, Ian used to work at Itchy Bond Records. Itchy Bond, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah Ian yeah. used to work at Itchy Bond. Like, yeah, he never worked at LaFace, but he did work with some LaFace artists. Like, he worked with TLC mm-hmm. and some, you know, some of them. You know, I definitely would. He had his feet, his feet firmly planted in the industry, in terms of discovering and creating talent. So, okay, so he brought you on to work with Organized Noise. Mm-hmm. I knew him from, cause when I well, see, we kind of skipping some things, but uh, let's go back, cause okay. I worked at V One O Three, and I kept seeing them music, them record people going back and forth. Like I met Millie Vanilli, I met all kind of folks. What? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And um and then my boss at V one oh three, his best friend was this man named uh Keith Fry that worked at Capitol Records. Mm-hmm. And my boss at V one oh three got a job up in New York and he couldn't take me with him. So he was like, Yo, um I, I can't take you to, to New York with me, but I I want you to go see this man and he's gonna he's gonna give you a job. And I was like, Okay, he was like, Call him and I called him and he was like, Yeah, um I want you to come to my office tomorrow and don't wear no jeans. And I was like, okay, shit. Right, <laughs> right. He was, up. he was like, don't wear no jeans. We dress up around here. I'm like, okay. I really didn't know what I was getting into other than I knew that Keith was his buddy and he used to work at Capitol. And he was had, he had like, like the big artist with him. Mm-hmm. So I went there and he gave me a job as his assistant. Mm-hmm. And he was like, yeah, Ray told me a lot about you. My assistant is taking another job. And, I, you know, I, I need an assistant. Can mm-hmm. you start tomorrow? And I was like, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so I started working at Capitol Records. It happened just like that, you know. I had my site set for, for them record people. You know, I wanted mm-hmm. to be, for, but I was working for the National Director of Radio Promotions for Capitol Records. Wow. So we promote, we managed all of them cats that was going to the radio stations and promoting them So you, you looked at them first, but you ended up getting the job above them. That's above crazy. managing they asses. That's yes, it was crazy. 12 of them across the country. Wow. And I had to manage their day-to-day activity and report to my boss who was there, who was the 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 vice where well, he eventually came vice president but he was the national director mm. so you know we managed like mc hammer the gap band we promoted these records full force that's how me and bow leg and lou became best friends what? but bow leg and lou is one of my closest friends to this day mm. um uh and i met him through capital records uh the, all kind of people i mean Bobby Brown, because my boss, Keith Fry, he worked at Capitol. His wife, Martha Fry, worked at MCA. And MCA had Guy, yeah. Bobby Brown, all of them, you know. So we, uh, uh, um, um, New Edition. Mm-hmm. So we, you know, but between the two of them being husband and wife, we saw all them shows. We was at all them bad boys. Wow. <laughs> we did MC Hammer. So I promoted at least three of MC Hammer's records for him. Like the first to quit. Was, please have let's, it on heard them and all please that. Please have it on heard them. Let's get it started. And even the infamous pumps and the bumps. The pumps and the bumps. <laughs> <laughs> which which is crazy because that kind of became his most famous song. <laughs> yeah, but that's the one that took him under too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was like, it it was did. These rocks with these da 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 da's on. <laughs> Man, I don't even know if they was that. <laughs> There was some speedos. <laughs> we was like, what the hell? <laughs> Pops in the bumps. And then I found out Tupac was involved. I'm like, Yo, how did this happen? <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's funny. So after that after that came out, that Pumps in the Bumps, that was probably the end of Capitol Records. You know, they closed, out, they closed our department. They closed the black music division. Just shut it down. Of Capitol Records, they was like, "Clink, it's over for y'all." 
and that had to be in 92 and that was around the time that I met Organized Noise because I used to go to the dungeon like I remember first Ian brought uh, Pat to my office at Capitol and I had a beautiful office like we had plants and shit all over the place Mm -hmm. all glass and everything and LaFace's office was right above ours so we watched LaFace move in we was out in Norcross we watched the trucks move in when LaFace opened up in Atlanta. So their first office was in, was in Norcross? J. Bird Alley. Yes, it was in Norcross. Their very first office. We we watched it happen. That's crazy. And they probably yeah. just moved in like small teams. Small mm-hmm. teams. It, was, it was Charlotte's. It was Brian Reed. It was his brother. It was L.A. It was... Um, this other lady, it was like maybe five people initially. Mm. Yeah, Vernon, Vernon Slaughter, their their uh their lawyer, you know. Yeah. It wasn't a lot. It wasn't a lot of people in initially, wow. at all. That's crazy. So you actually like learned how to work a record from like leaving the studio to like it being multi platinum. Like, mm-hmm. like you learned the inner mechanics of it all. Yes, I learned how to work records nationally through radio. How to how to manage those people that go out and get them ads. And back then we were we were we were governed by R and R, and Billboard charts and and Sound Scan and Media Base. Like was just coming into play. Like we, I, I watched the transition from you know analog, so to speak, for lack of a better term, into this digital world of everything. Not only for monetizing money, but the way that we actually um, counted records and and counted how how um, sales were calculated. We watched all of that change. Mm. It, it, it it all because it was manual rec- reporting at first. Like the record, the stores had to report to retail um, what they call reps mm-hmm. that would report those sales to the the record companies. That was the old school way. You know, the reps would call and be like, how many such and such did you sell this week? Mm. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and bringing in new records. I'll bring this in, I'm going to take this out. You know, they was working them records from the retail level. Mm. So I even got to see that from a retail side and having to engage, you know, with the with the reps on the phones and having to, you know, report record sales. Like, we had to make a, we had to count, like, how many records we sold in the 80s. Mm. Like, manually. Cause I remember I used to do stuff when I was a kid. I used to do stuff for organized noise, call the call the record stores and mm-hmm. uh, place records and stuff. But honestly, I didn't know. I just knew that part of it. I didn't know yeah. what else was going on. You know? Yeah, I mean? we, y'all were field market representatives. Y'all went out and put up displays. Yeah, displays. You know, we, had, we used to have we used to have receptions at the stores. Mm. You know where we would we would have the artists do performances in the stores for the customers, you know, and have whole, have D103 come out to the record store, to Tower Records. We were investing in billboards. Yeah, I Outside remember. of Towers. Like, that was part of our marketing budgets back then. Yeah, they would call, like, in-stores or something, right? With in-store, in-stores, yeah. yeah. Meet yeah. and greets. Meet and greets. And, and, greets. and, greets. and yeah. that's, that was that was most of the artist's time back then, like, like, beyond before, like, doing tours and stuff, they was in those record stores. They was in them record stores, yeah. we, especially in them college towns, you know, because it was all about them mom and pop record stores back then, too. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily the chains. You had a lot of, of sales from those mom and pops, like those third world records. Remember third world? You talking about the reggae Super, group? Or the no, no, no. Store. The record store was a record store called third world, Super Sounds. I remember Super Sounds. Yeah, Definitely. you know, yep. all, of those, all of those records. Those were very impactful in how we marketed and sold our records. Before we went digital, really, it's a whole nother world. Because you had to cater to the customers that were coming to their store, and you had to draw the customer to the retail outlet in order to sell your records. There was a time when we used to fight, fight for what they call rack space in the in the in the chains, like in the Walmart, in the Target, and in the Kmart, and yeah. in Best Buy. You know, you want your you want you want prime rack rack space for your CDs and your and actually even albums. You know, albums, yep. that and was when I, they had to pop the um, what were they called? The uh, they were like cutouts, 
that you mm-hmm. put on the counters and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Cutouts, counter, counter pop ups, all kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, and if I think about my transition over my the span of my career, I watched us go from. I mean, I've been in I've been in the world of eight track as a kid. My daddy had eight tracks. You know, forty fives and albums. Mm-hmm. Eight track to cassette. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, from cassette to, to CD, yeah. you know, from that CD to doggone mini CD and then and, and mini disc, disc and, and, mini and, disc and, the and little dance, tapes, little ADAT tapes, little ADATs, you know, um, mm-hmm. all up until the, the MP3, and now we are streaming, you know, and even from the how we make records, you know, yeah. we were making records on two inch tape, mixing down the half inch tape, yeah, you know, then we went from to DAT from to ADAT. Yeah. Then we started doing stuff digitally. And you now, no more. You, all you need now is a computer, a laptop, mm-hmm. and, and, and some internet, and some internet, and you in there. Yeah, you yeah. can make a whole record and mm-hmm. mix that bitch and have it on out in the internet and for sale. Yep, just you know? like that, just like that. Mm-hmm. So, do you think that that um, hurt the industry or helped it? For me, you know. Coming from the business side, mm-hmm. you know, going from you know selling albums to to streaming singles, it, I mean, in streaming services, it hurt. Yeah, it hurt because from you know, I'm not gonna get too technical, but from like a a controlled composition standpoint and a mechanical licensing standpoint and statutory rate standpoint, you know, we're getting cheated, you know, because we were getting paid. You know, uh, on whole albums, you right. know, in our deals, like you, you get an album deal rate, and then you get a, a single rate that you were getting paid off of, and you know, everybody had to, you, you had to split a percentage of, you know, your sales with your producers, and you know, whoever your featured artists were, you know, you you had your artists, you get points and your percentages and all of those things, your advances, and you counted on those record sales, you counted on them album selling. Because we knew we was getting nine ninety nine off them albums, you know. Right, right. <laughs> you know, and when the album ceased to exist in the digital realm, mm-hmm. that killed us as publishers and composition holder rights holders. Because now we're getting paid on a tenth of what we were getting paid for, you know, twenty years ago. Right. You right. know, you be waiting on them daggone checks to come checks. Them checks I used to have for Rico Patton Ray was like three hundred thousand dollars every three months, you know, a half a million dollars, you know, and then they started dwindling down to like three hundred thousand or a hundred thousand. And I'm like, damn, my little percentage is getting fucked up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ain't gonna buy nothing. Hey, that's... Fifty thousand. I'm like, shit. <laughs> that's crazy. What's funny though is that you can hear a number like three hundred thousand and it be like s- small in comparison. You know what I mean? Like that lets you know how big the industry was at the time. Man, we was getting paid like them checks was beautiful. Mm. I'm telling, you, and they came like all I had to do was just wait. I was looking. Up, I had the calendar set like yes. All I got to make it is till the till April. <laughs> April, April, end of April, May, beginning of May, it's about to be beautiful around this rich, you know? Yeah, yeah. So you just had to wait. And certain checks came every six months. Certain checks came every three months. And, and certain checks came every 45 days, you know? Mm-hmm. So, you know, you just had to had to just gauge it. I mean, and I remember times I used to have checks just put up for Rico, Pat, and Ray. Mm. They, they would think they was broke, and I'd be like, oh, no, I got about $30,000, you know? Go. Here you go. Take this rain. Here you go. Wow. <laughs> Call Rico. We got, some, we got some money. I'm like, yeah, I think I got about fifty thousand dollars up under here. You got fifty thousand dollars? Like, mm-hmm. You you need me to? <laughs> Girl, I love you. <laughs> He'll tell you. He will tell you. His whole little voice will change. Like, wow. That's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> I used to put money up because I knew their asses. You know. Yeah. I knew them. That's how I was moving. Everything was moving That's fast. That's how I was moving. Yeah. Fast pace. Mm-hmm. I do, used to sleep on their money. Do you think that? Do you think that 
songs, like the individual song now is um like being uh like only charging a dollar for each individual song is it, you think that's undercutting it? It is, I mean, it's just the nature of the beast now. It's the way that we do business. You can't sell an individual single for any more than that. Mm-hmm. You just can't. So, I mean, you just, the, it just don't add up. Right, 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 right. Um, so, where we are is where we are. I mean, we have to be smart about how we make records now. You know, you can't be having a whole bunch of features and samples and stuff on your record. You got to really have, you know, original music mm-hmm. because you Board to give any of your record away because we don't have them to give away anymore. Right. Even though but people still you can expect get it to be free. Yeah, but but you can get rich off of a single, and it, you don't even have to sell it now. It can streaming. just be airplay. Yeah, streaming. You don't have to sell it. You can give it away for free and still be very, very, very but, well off 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 of if your if your record gets makes it to the radio. Makes it into tw- into heavy rotation. That bitch ain't got to sell. Do you? Um, I've been hearing talks about them <laughs> trying to renegotiate rates for streaming. Have you? Have you? Ha- have you? Um, do you know anything about that? No, I, you know I kind of have been a little remo- removed from the music world mm-hmm. over the past five years or so. Mm-hmm. You know because I, I've I've gravitated over into the film space. So, you know, as much as I try to keep up with what's happening, I haven't really been um, up on trends as I should be as a music professional. But I'm just, you know, really in another direction, learning new things. Mm -hmm. So in order for me to be free to learn the new things that I'm being exposed to in the entertainment industry, I kind of have to free my brain space up, you know. Right. To really, you know, grasp and encompassing how to make film, how to how to manage film budgets, you know, mm-hmm. it's like managing a film budget is like managing three recording budgets, maybe five recording budgets at one time. Because they break it down into individual things that need to be. I was watching Location. some documentaries on that. It was making like I think it was Star Wars, and I was seeing how they was breaking that budget down into like graphics, and then it was like. Production and mm-hmm. it was like three, it was like, yeah, all kind of departments. You got music, you got you got hair, makeup, you got wardrobe, you got costumes, you got props, you got set deck, you got locations, and I'm just strictly in locations. Mm. And in locations, I manage right now on the film that I'm working on right now. What in my location budget, I have eight micro budgets. <laughs> of individual locations for this movie that I'm shooting through um, August. Mm. And I have to manage simultaneously all eight of these budgets. One might be 300000 one might be 700000 one might be 50000 one might be 80000 you know, but it's all working. Like, at least two of these budgets are, are active at one time. Or maybe three or four. Wow, that's wild. Oh, okay. and it's beautiful. Okay, so I don't want to get ahead of myself. Because <laughs> now we on to a whole another thing. All right. <laughs> all right, so. And that's what I was explaining. I was, I was like, man, tell you the truth. I was like, dude, you did so much stuff. I was like, I couldn't sit here and begin to start to tell you. Like, I know what's going on. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, because I just, you know, I just remember. I, You know, I'd be around. I. You were part of this. You One lived thing, this with me. Yeah, you like lived, I was there. We lived so, this together. Yeah, but I wasn't like, I guess, you know, I wasn't like in the business like that. So I just, I remember stuff like, even when you was, wasn't around, a common phrase I remember hearing, call Dee Dee. <laughs> that was, you know what I mean? That's like a common phrase. Like, like what? Call Dee Dee. You know what I mean? Like, just not even just, organized noise just a lot of people would be like man we need to call Didi you know what I mean and um and I just always remembered that like man Didi know how to do everything like if you, if you did you know what I mean anything business Didi was on it <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> that's crazy but yeah 
I, I remember that. So um, I kind of gave like a background on like, mm. well, like I said, I want you to kind of say it. So where we was at was you was at Capitol. Mm-hmm. The face moved in above you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right? So um, now how did you Pat, go? Ian Pat introduced me to Pat. Pat uh-huh. brought Pat to my office, right? Uh-huh. And then um, they closed down the Black Music Division of Capitol. Uh-huh. And I didn't have no job. And so I just started going to the dungeon. Like, I just started going to the dungeon. And I used to take my computer over to the dungeon like it was my job every day because I didn't have nothing else to do. Like, really? I just had nothing else to do. Like, so I, I would just go over there. I had this laptop, this big ass laptop, and this big ass little. Oh, my, I, and you know, I always kind of, my mama, oh, we had it going on. So I had my little portable printer, uh-huh. my little laptop from the 80s. Like, people didn't have this type of stuff. Right, because like, I, I know. I'm like, at the <laughs> time, we didn't want to have a laptop. <laughs> right, I was over there printing stuff, you know, like yeah. lyrics and stuff. And we had that paper where you had to pull the little dot, the little sides off the paper. <laughs> He used to fold up like a, uh, yeah. Qu- yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, had, I used to come to the dungeon and pull my shit out and set it up. I'm like, what we doing? <laughs> yeah, let's go. <laughs> let's go. What we doing? Like, what we got to do? Like, for real. And there were times when, you know, if we had to go to interviews. Mm-hmm. You know, we were setting up interviews. My friend, Rhonda Baraka, had that, had that, uh, magazine called Tafresia. Her husband, Tony, rest in peace. You know, they were one of the first people to ever do an article on Outcast and Organized Noise, and whenever that something happened, they they all, we were always on the cover. We always had the cover of Tafresia. Tony and Rhonda always showed us love. Wow. So, you know, we did that. We had My Brother's Keeper. You know, yeah. we had a That dog was the dog. club. It was jumping for a minute. I remember mm-hmm. that. MBK. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, club. MBK. Yeah, yeah. We had Belinda and Victor. They owned a little uh, rehearsal facility that we used to be able to rehearse out out of. You know, we did the the um, showcase for um, Raleigh Reed at uh-huh. Victor and Belinda's, and he turned us down the first time. Like I remember, like all of that. Like we all piled up in like two, three cars, and nobody had no car. Like I had a car. I think Rico had a raggedy ass car. You uh-huh. know. <laughs> uh-huh. You know, we just all, we could do what we had to do. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Scraping up money for pizzas, sleeping on the floor. I slept on the floor with them. Like, I slept on the floor, too. Wow. Like, we, we did what we had to do. Yeah. For yeah. real. Yeah. I remember. I remember sleeping on the floors. <laughs> but no joke. <laughs> yeah. Like, move over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was real. Shit. Yeah, because you didn't lay down. I'm not driving back to Alpharetta. Time. Remember, yeah. I lived in Alpharetta. Yep, yep, yep. You had, yep. You lived in Alpharetta. You and Malia. Yep. Yeah. Like yep. y'all move over. Me and Malia, we spending the night. <laughs> <laughs> yep. On the floor. I'm trying to think. Let me see how good my memory is. I remember you having a. Was it a little mint car? A little little green car. I used to have a little green Hyundai. Hyundai. Little green Hyundai, yep. Yeah, and then Goody Mob and them wrecked that car. They tried to lie. When we was when we had that office over there on Ralph McGill. Yep, yep. Them niggas tore my dang car up. Never paid for it, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I gave them my car to go somewhere. Came back and the whole side of the car was just messed up. Oh man, that's crazy. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I remember I wound it, it up was selling a- that car to Rube. His girlfriend needed a car. I wound up selling that car to Rude. For real, that's crazy. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. <laughs> I remember yeah. you had a, a. It was it like a Jeep or something. It was a little Jeep or something. Well, who? Ray really? had a Jeep. Ray, Ray no, had a Ray Jeep. Had a, Ray had a Trooper. No, Ray had a Jeep too for a minute. He had a black Jeep for a minute. You don't remember that Jeep? Yeah, with the big tires. Yes. Oh, yeah. I remember that Jeep. We used to go mm-hmm. mudding in it. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Then he yeah. got rid of the Jeep and we got the Trooper. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. I thought before that, what did you have? I thought you got something else be- after that. I thought yeah. I had like a Durango at one point. The Durango. I had that Volvo. The remember Volvo. Remember that Volvo? Yeah. That Volvo SUV when the SUVs first came out? 
Yeah. I had like one of the first ones of them, them Bobo XT, whatever they was. Yeah. Yep, I had that. But um, I'm trying to think of what else I used to draw. I can't remember. It's a blur. <laughs> I know it. I just be trying to put the eras together, but I remember the mint card. That's what. That's what it was. That's what it was real. Yep. Mm-hmm. Everything was yep. just just like really getting big at that time. Mm-hmm. Okay, so all right, so then when you met them, you start going to the dungeon. That was before they had ever put a record out, right? Uh, they had put out that CB4 record. That CB4 Lifeline. They was working on PA. Lifeline. And um, some kind of way, yeah, Lifeline had came out on CB4 soundtrack, but the PA album was not done. Um, so they, they were working on that, had just met Outkast, mm. you know, they were still Black wo- Dog and Black Wolf, they, you know, they had just started coming around. Black Dog and Black Wolf. Black Dog wolf. and Black Wolf started coming around, um, and... I heard those I, stories with the blonde hair. Yes, yeah, and then Dre lived in Decatur, so I think at that time, by that time, was I living in Decatur? I can't remember. I cannot remember. It's all still a blur, but I just remember I used to have to take Dre home to his mama house. Mm-hmm. Yep. And Dre used, to, Dre used to go just like everywhere with me. He was just like my little baby. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I remember one time this artist came to town. Uh-huh. He was from New York. He was the uh, the rapper Jazz. Uh-huh. I don't know if I remember Jazz. He was the old rapper from New York, and he was trying to like holler at me. Mm-hmm. And I was like, Dre, will you come with me? <laughs> he was he, like, yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> that's funny. It yeah. was like, what was it? It was like a date? Or yeah, he like wanted a- me to take him home or something. Like he, We had been at my brother's keeper or something. Uh-huh. And he was trying to holler. And he was, and I don't know. I don't know. Like, I remember him from Capitol. Like, when I worked at Capitol, like, we had a little... You know, he used to holler at me then because I think he was signed to Capitol and he was down there. It was some shit. And, you know, he was like, just take me home or something. And I was like, all right, all right, all right. And I was like, Dre, just come with me. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Just come with me. Just come with me. Like, you just gonna have to come with me. (laughs) That's real. So what did you, what, what exactly did you do for outcast like as far as that like the first project because i know we like i know you was peaches i don't think we said that either no we never talked about that i was peaches on the first outcast album but i we turned that album in i mean we did everything i i it was a blur like we did all we turned did all of the lyrics did the samples um it was it was the delivered the record to the face they needed a manager, so my friend Mia started kind of managing. I don't know if you remember Mia coming around. Mm-hmm. Mia was a light skinned girl, uh, really pretty, but she was helping manage Outcast at the time because they blew up quick. Mm-hmm. And in addition to that, we was I was braiding hair like, <laughs> <laughs> like that. Dre ass wouldn't let nobody else braid his hair but me. I don't don't know why like Dre is and Dre has this scalp where you part it and then it, it moves so the part don't never be straight like for his first for the first album cover Dre's hair is by me <laughs> I used to live in Alpharetta Dre used to have niggas bring him to Alpharetta to braid for me to braid his hair for him to go out of town mm. and I'm like dude I got to go to work in the morning and this is like when I used to work for Pebbles and, you know, I'm like, I got to go to work. I got to go to work. <laughs> and I'll be uh-huh. up to 4 o'clock in the morning braiding this dude hair. That's crazy. Having to be at work at 9, 10, you know. Yeah. For him to catch a flight, you know. It, it was crazy. But he was, I don't me and him, you know, I, and I was married. I'm, you know, married Ray. You know, it wasn't never nothing crazy between me and Dre. Dre was just like my baby. Like, we just did everything. And then Twan, too. Like, Twan loved Malia. Like, him and Malia had a bond. Like, he used to always be with Malia. Mm-hmm. When we would go and do stuff, or we had to go out of town, or Malia would have to be at the studio, I could always leave Malia with Big Boy. Mm-hmm. Uh-oh. My phone is... is let me see. Hold on, man. 
my baby calling. Oh, uh, you got a phone call. Yeah. Um, you know, he I could always leave Malia mm-hmm. with big boy with toys, food, a bottle. She would be very well taken care of. <laughs> right. So we were like a family. Like I remember when Dre when Big and Shalita first met. You know, mm-hmm. I used to have to drive them jokers around. Like I used to have to pick Shalita up. Like we would, you know, it was it was some other stuff going on that a lot of people don't know. Like they, you know, mm-hmm. I watched them go from teenagers to men to fathers to millionaires to bitch, very shrewd and and astute businessmen. Right. I, I was there for that th- their whole lives. You know, Rico, Pat, and Ray, too. Yeah. Ray, you know, Ray was probably in his early 20s, but Rico and, and, and Pat, they was like 17, 18. Mm. But Big and Dre were like 16, 17. They like Hadassah's age now. Right. You know, impressionable, young, with, you know, with mamas who loved them. You know, well, you know, Big, you know, just you know, Big was out here with his auntie, but families who loved them. You know, just, it, it, it was... And we had to be responsible for them, mm-hmm. you know, especially especially Drake, because his mama didn't play. His mama didn't like nobody. My Benjamin did not like nobody. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> for real. Mm-mm. Wow, she didn't get it at the time. She was like, uh, no, and it took her a minute to get it, but when she got it, she got it good. Yeah, she was very well taken care of. Rest her soul. Mm-hmm. But we, you know, like a lot of these, you, we being on the inside looking out, mm-hmm. it's hard to see the results of your labor. Mm-hmm. It's really hard because all we wanted was to just win, you know, to do good. Yeah. And they did good. I was telling somebody about how waterfalls changed our lives. Like, you know, that was a turning point. That was the shit that changed everything. Right. That waterfalls record. Mm-hmm. Right, that was like the signature song at the time for everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, phones started ringing. Mm-hmm. You know, prices went up. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. you set standards. Yeah, send a list to the studio. This is what I want. I want fruit and tea and shit. <laughs> I need a bottle of liquor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a hundred chicken wings. <laughs> For Rico, right. <laughs> at ten, twelve, and two. <laughs> and and when you was there for organized noise records too. Yeah, of course. Well, I know, well, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to put it all together. Like I know, like I saw. That was on River Road. <laughs> that was them days. Yeah. That's when I was. That was when I was going to the work with kids, with babies, with a dog on playpen in my office yeah. yeah hell yeah i was there for organized noise records yeah every minute of it i opened it up and shut that bitch down right put the shit in storage when it was right. over because that's was when the, the first office one was in on, and the last one out that's when the office was on ralph mcgill ralph mcgill auburn avenue as well yeah in auburn avenue the um mm-hmm. upstairs because that was like over there, because who, uh, that rim shot, the Eric Sermon rim shot was like on the corner across from it or something. That was over there when we was on Ralph McGill. You could walk to the rim shop. Yep, to the rim shop. Yeah, it was Mm -hmm. popping back there. Yeah, that's what we used to call the record stores. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. That's when y'all would be calling them record stores. Getting in trouble because we were putting stickers everywhere. (laughs) If we put no stickers on no damn street signs and stuff. We were putting them everywhere. Because the Olympics was here at the time, and they were trying to make Atlanta beautiful. Yeah. So we was getting in trouble for shit like that. Yep. Yep, yep. Rico was I remember getting cussed out for cause we had we had stickered up some club. I was like, but what, what what else are we supposed to do with it? Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? They traced them stickers right back to us and we yep. get a check. Yep, yep, mm-hmm. they went right back. But yep. um but yeah, them was the days. There was the days. Mm-hmm. So so I was I remember me being on Cool Breeze record, ten points, East Point's greatest hits. Ten points. Yeah. Go back and listen to that record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ten points. And my favorite album out of every organized.
Nas Noise album ever made was Lil Will. Mm. In I'll, Better Days. I know. In Better Days was that. That, that was that one. Like <sighs> To this day, that's my favorite album. Yeah. Better Days. Them songs. I was thinking about the song April Rain today. I'm like, these, these May rains in here like April rain, you know? Yeah, 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 mm-hmm. that was, that was some of, that was, yeah, that was some of the best music. That was some of the best music and some of the hardest times, mm-hmm. you know, is on the same token, mm-hmm. you know, professionally and personally, you know, it was, it was hard, it was hard, but we made it through. Yeah, because I mean, it. what was it like to have that kind of, because I'm like, Seeing now how you was doing one thing with Capital, and then to to start off with organized noise and have it explode like that, like with that kind of workload, what was it like to transition into that? Like, was it really overnight, or was it like? It wasn't overnight. Mm-hmm. It wasn't overnight. Um, and it was. Remember when I used to work with Pebbles? Uh uh-uh. uh. You don't remember when I worked with Pebbles? No, okay, see, so I didn't know that either. So before before Organized Noise could pay me, they helped me get a job working with Pebbles mm-hmm. at her company, Savvy Records. Even they didn't even really help me get that job because me and Ray had to kind of hide the fact that we was dating because Pebbles was like, "You can't be fraternizing with the producers." <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "Girl, if you only knew how we was fraternizing." So that was real. Producers. That wasn't just in the TLC movie. <laughs> no, that was for real. Don't be fraternizing with the producers. I'm like, okay. You don't know I was fraternizing with the producers before I got this job. Oh, shit. That's good. <laughs> that was good. Yeah. But um, my friend Josh used to be Pebble's assistant. Uh-huh. Josh Hargrove. She she um goes right back to Keith Fry. She was married to Keith Fry's son, Xavier. Uh-huh. She married him. But Xavier had moved to Florida, and, and Josh wanted to go work for Jermaine Dupree, daddy, so she can be in Florida to get her man. So she was like, look, I'm going to go to Florida to go work with doggone Michael Mulder. I'm going to need you to come take this job with Pebbles. Mm-hmm. I'm going to train you. I'm going to teach you everything. But, I, I, you know, she told me to pick my assistant, and I pick you. And I was like, damn. And I didn't have no job at the time, but I was working for Rico Ray and Pat for free because I didn't have no nothing to do at you know, because mm-hmm. I had lost my job at Capital. So she picked me to be her assistant. She was like, I had to find my replacement. The only person that I know that is capable of doing this job, working with the Reeds, is you. And I was like, shit. So I went from watching them move in to becoming part of their household. Mm-hmm. So that in itself was something else. And working for Organized Noise under the table on the slide behind the be- behind the curtain. <laughs> so they didn't know that you was working for organized no, <laughs> no clue no clue that's crazy mm-hmm. that's crazy but you know what yeah I would probably would have lost my job if she knew if she knew it was tight she knew everybody knew each other yeah. but she didn't know I was leaving her office going straight to the dungeon to go work on the southern playlistic record to turn in her husband <laughs> So, um, how, what do you think was like, what happened with, with little, the little Will album? Like, why, like, cause I it was know a lot. it was just politics. It was a lot. It was in the scope. It was a deal. It was a lot of things that were happening business wise with organized noise at the time, you know, that I really, you know, I don't, I'm not at liberty to really disclose Mm-hmm. Um, just because I would never tell. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a lot going on. Mm-hmm. A lot going on, a lot of moving parts. And, you know, Interscope pulled the plug on the deal. And, but they, they, they did not accept Lil Will's record for whatever reason. I don't know if it was something between J- Rico and Jimmy Iovine. I don't know. But that was one of the most incredible records ever made in history to me. Really it was like one of the that. most beautiful records. 
that has never seen its due. And it's been well over 10 years since those records were recorded. The re-record clause is very much, ex- it, it, it has expired. Mm-hmm. If they wanted to, they can go back and put that record out and just re-record it. You know, mm-hmm. the Interscope owns that master, but they own the composition. You know, and those are the tricks of trade after a certain amount of time. You know, you, yeah, you got your master, but I'm free to do with my compositions, whatever the hell I want to do See, with them. that's what I'm talking about so, right there. You know, that record could be re-recorded and, and put, re-put out. But, you know, that ain't my business no more. Yeah. But if, it was, if I was still running Organized Noise and, and doing what I was doing, that record would have been out. Right, right. See, that's what oh, I'm my children, that record would have been out. Yeah. And I want to put my disclaimer out there. I I didn't want to interview you. I'm not digging for no kind of dirt on nothing. You know what I mean? All I wanted was, um, all I'm looking for is those kinds of tidbits that we could use. Like those are, it, those are like, if you know how to, how to work your business, I guess. Like what what kind of business you're into, then you would know those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you know your business, you know that over a certain amount of time, contract- contractually, you're free. And you can do what you want to do. Mm-hmm. Fuck them and they masters. You know, who? I own the composition. Mm-hmm. I own the house. <laughs> right, right. Well, yeah. Yeah. I can pick yeah. my house up and move it to some different land. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's dope. You yeah, know? That's dope. Because I don't know, you know, I think a lot of times artists just get caught up in the works we've done and it's like you get attached to them and you know you know what i mean all that kind of stuff i used to -hmm. to call it demo love i used to be like y'all don't get it don't fall into no demo love like we used to hear them demos of them records and big boy used to fall in demo love a lot Uh, you know uh you know it would be a sample in it and you know it just it was just a raw track yeah and let somebody hear it and then, you know, they come back and produce the record and they take the sample out and, you know, play music and they're like, I don't like that. You know, like, that ain't what I heard. I'm like, your ass fell in demo love. <laughs> yeah, that was a de- <laughs> That was a demo. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's crazy. That used to happen all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. And so you you did a lot of the um, actual, like, or like the paperwork and stuff like that for like records, mm-hmm. making sure things were cataloged and, and credited and right that kind of stuff. Right, I did um, for all of for all of the Outkast records, at least the, the early ones like Southern Playlistic, mm-hmm. Elevators, um, Soul Food. Uh, g- g- the, I, I have nightmares still sometimes transcribing some of Cujo's lyrics. <laughs> oh, Man, <that's> t- <laughs> I, I remember typing up them lyrics and being almost in tears like I oh, can't understand what he is saying <laughs> I used to be like I would call him on the phone and read it to him and be like you know my old bird on the stove cooking some food what you say after that <laughs> <laughs> my crunch Right. Put C R U D balling. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I asked him one time something. He said in a lyric. He looked at me. He said, "What you think I said?" <laughs> I said, oh, shit. I said oh, "Like oh, I do not know." <laughs> what you said. I have no clue as to what you, you be making up your own words. Pluto got his own language. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can I get him? I'm trying to remember. I said, I was like, "What'd you say?" It sounded yeah. like he said, "Feed my Impala." He said, "Feed my Impala." <laughs> he said, "Shit, that shit hard as hell, fuck." <laughs> he said, "I can't, man." I, I said, "Damn, I don't know what he, I don't know what he said." <laughs> but yes, so I had to dog on, type up all of them lyrics. Do all, you know, clear all the samples, make sure everybody knows samples in them. Do everything to deliver the album to the label. So that meant making sure that we had clean producing contra- 
producer contracts, making sure that we had side artist contracts in place, making sure all of our work for hire forms were done, making sure all of the union forms were submitted, you know, making sure all the musicians have been paid, making sure all the studio sessions were in, <sighs> administering the budget, making sure all the bills were paid. Wow. You know, that was the biggest thing coming in under budget. You had to do all of this in a budget. Like they might give you $250,000 and you have to have a budget for all of this stuff. Like, so I have a line item for tapes, a line item for studio, a line item for travel, a line item for side artists, a line item for producer fees. You know, you got to samples. You know, back in them days, them recording budgets were, they were something else. Wow. You know, I think the biggest one I had was for um, Even in Darkness. Mm, for real. Like that, that budget, that budget might have been $1.5 million. What? That recording budget, yeah. But everybody had to be paid out of that one point five million dollars too. Yeah, but still, think, that's a big. That's that's huge. I think everybody but Outkast had to get paid off of that because we had to record the record too. I didn't pay all them cats. Mm. Mm. And the musicians, and the studio time, and the producers. And the producers. That was a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So. You know the the thing that people they love music, but there it's really it's it's a it's, it is a music business for a reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have your business taken care of, you know, <laughs> you won't make no money off the music. <clears throat> and it can be lucrative, mm -hmm. be very lucrative. And today, like you, all you need is a single to hit, and you straight. You don't have the responsibility of recording an entire album anymore. You can build an album. You can build your album from singles. You don't have to do an album anymore. You're not limited to that or relegated to that, I should say, mm -hmm. to that commitment. Even though the messed up part is these, these record labels still try to issue out deals like that. And it's like, these days are over. Like, I'm not doing no seven album deal. You can kiss my ass. I'm not doing that. You know? Right. <laughs> No, right. I'm not giving you a one album deal. I'll and give you now a, everybody's talking about. I'll this. give you a three song deal. How about that? Yeah, everybody's talking about this 360 deal now. Mm-hmm. Like you that know. ain't no money in in records no more. Right. You got to think about the history of the of the record business, of the music business. The record business was built on the foundation of manufacturing and selling long playing records. Albums, LPs, LP album, long playing record. Mm -hmm. That's what that stood for. Mm -hmm. That's what this whole thing was built on. The federal statutory rate on on which compositions can be can be paid per per album, number of songs per album. There were federal federal regulations and rules set in place on the mechanical licensing rate, and that's just the mechanical licensing rate was built on back when they had those mechanical records back in the day. Remember when they had those wind-up records? That's what that rate was based on. For real? <laughs> That's what it mean when they say mechanical royal? Mm -hmm. Man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's technically the, the, the number the, the number of time of the minute the number of minutes that song plays. You get paid oh. based on the number of minutes. On the number of minutes that the song plays. Mm-hmm. Mechanical mm -hmm. royalty, and that's the the actual crank turn. Mm -hmm. That's what that was based upon. So the history of the music business was based on the manufacturing and selling of records, of music, of albums. So businesses licensed music from composers, mm -hmm. songwriters. Mm -hmm. You know, they controlled the number of compositions. They would pay for mm -hmm. at at a, at a normal statutory rate, mechanical rate, or a reduced statutory rate. Mm -hmm. That's what those contracts was built upon. Mm -hmm. You know, if you know about controlled compositions, you know that you know a label will uh um, will send you a deal and and ask that you reduce your mechanical rate from a hundred percent to seventy five percent, and you as the composition owner 
have the right in every in every record company to say no. I want to be paid at a hundred percent, and all you got to do is say no. I want to be paid at a hundred percent, and that contract can be amended just that quickly because it's your right as a composition holder to be paid at seventy five at a hundred percent. But record labels want to pay seventy five percent of the rate. <laughs> So they put it in an agreement. This is one of them things. And if you don't know, you just be signing that shit and you don't know it's your right, it's your federal right to get paid 100% of the mechanical rate. Of the federally mandated mechanical rate, the statutory rate that they're supposed to pay composition owners for licensing their music on their long playing records. Because they still pay by that rate right now through BMI and that. They certainly do. And you can say, I want all my money. All of it. Not a reduced rate. I don't want to be paid at a reduced rate. I want to be paid, to be paid at the full rate. Mm. And they have to do it. That's crazy. Because you crossed it out and put 100%. And now they have to do it. Yeah, and that's the fine print. That's the stuff. You know, that, Benny, that's the fine print. For any artist, don't get caught under the con- control composition clause. Look for that, you know, and don't don't mix don't mix your record deal with your publishing deal. Mm-hmm. Oh, so that, that's an apple and an orange. Don't even come to me with a recording deal that addresses anything to do with my publishing. If you ain't got some money to give me, mm-hmm. I will cuss you out. <laughs> That's crazy. That's crazy. That's crazy. But at that time, how did you how did you learn that? Because there was no school to talk that no, to teach nothing no like that. I had to learn it. I you know when I grew with organized noise, I grew with the business. So as we grew, you know, I, I learned from the lawyers. I had to learn. I had to read those contracts. I had to work with Jess Rosen, who was, you know, with Greenberg Troy. They had the finest and the best entertainment lawyer in all of the world. You know, they had Jeff Smith and Jess Rosen, and they all worked for Joel Katz. You know, we had they, we had the best. So they talked me through those contracts. They were like, Didi, and I and it, I was at the point where I was pre-negotiating the contracts before they got to Jess because Jess was like, I don't want to see a contract unless we got 100% cold c- control composition. We got this, we got that, you know, we these many points, you know, like don't bring me the contract unless these things are already in place. These are your standard deal points. So if somebody ain't giving you these standard deal points in your agreement, it's subpar, don't accept it. Mm. So I, you know, I had my marching orders. My agreements had to come to the lawyer in a certain a certain way. Because my lawyers didn't where they were so big time that they didn't have time to negotiate them little points. Mm. Them little points better already be in place because that's what we deserved. We wrote waterfall, waterfalls. Fuck that. We deserved the best. Four points, you know, <laughs> yeah. escalations, you know, escalated points at, at so many sales and, you know, just all kind of ridiculous shit, you know? <laughs> and then you have to really go back and keep up and keep track of all of that stuff as it comes mm-hmm. into play. Mm-hmm. So that's reading. That's knowing contract. That's knowing music law without ever having to go to law school. Right. And I wanted to go to law school so bad, but, you know, I didn't have time. I kept having babies and, you know, <laughs> running mm-hmm. a company and being a wife as well as being, you know, running a business and, you know, trying to fulfill my own dreams. Like, I used to always tell everybody, like, I am not no household. I'm a, I'm finna be me. Like, <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm finna do me. Like, I don't care. Like, I'm not just Ray Murray wife. Like, I'm Dee Dee Murray. Like, mm-hmm. I'm Dee Dee. Like, Dee Dee had a name before she stepped up in this joint. Like, right. y'all recognize. <laughs> Organized noise did not make me. Mm-hmm. I was already made before I walked through the door. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah. Let's not play. You was already Dee Dee, definitely, Mm -hmm. when I met you, when I first saw you. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, so let's not forget that, and let's not get that twisted. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. These are facts. 
that's mm-hmm. crazy. Man, that's, that's crazy. actual fact. So, I mean, but I, I love, you know, I, I wouldn't trade my life for nothing in the world. I look back and there were so many other things that I could have done. Mm-hmm. You know, when I left Capitol, I could have went to New York. You know, I could have went to California. You know, there were plenty of jobs out there. I did go to California, you know, to, to, to go see my friends after I left Capitol Records mm-hmm. and had some options. But I chose to stay here. I chose to stay in Atlanta. And something drew me to that dungeon. And to that had the energy at that time, like it just man, the energy at that time. We used to get dressed up, grown ass women in their twenties, like twenty four, twenty five, getting dressed up to go to the dungeon. <laughs> like, who does that? <laughs> get dressed up. Are you going to the dungeon, girl? <laughs> to go over there to have your new hair smell like weed. Like, come on. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty Don't much. Don't a whole ass outfit and shit to go to the dungeon. Yeah, that's the, that's the dungeon. The dungeon smell like weed and more weed. weed. And funk and more weed. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the most, I mean, my soul was there. Like, my, my everything just drew me to that dungeon. I just saw potential. I just saw talent. I just saw you know, rawness. I, mm-hmm. I, I, I was home, like, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was just home. I just knew I was home. Everything that I, you know, I, I knew I wanted to learn how to make records because I, oh, I, I went back to, I'm going back to that dream it and do it thing. You know, after I learned, I sold records, learned how to promote records at the radio station, became that rate, that record person that I always wanted to be. I wanted to then learn how to make records. And I got put right in that circumstance with organized noise and with Pebbles because Pebbles taught me the excellence on the standards in which records should be made. We learned records the LaFace way. You know, we worked in LaCoco in L.A. and Pebbles' house in their basement, mm. you know, That's around different. the... Yeah, the <laughs> That's finest. They were They were spending money at that time. That was... It was all baby, you know, it was, that's the, it was coming. It was happening at that time. And I was fortunate enough to record her albums with her Mm -hmm. um, and learn the read way of recording excellent records Mm -hmm. from the way that the studio needed to be set to the types of tapes we needed to buy to the, the engineers that needed to be sitting at the boards to get the warm sounds that we needed for those records to sound as thick as they sound, the type of gear that we had to rent and have. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, all of that. Yeah. All of that, the racks, the gear, the filters, you know, the, everything. The type these of boards the real that we ones, not the plug-ins. Had. These are the, Ooh, the <laughs> dang real racks. <laughs> yeah, the real racks. You know? The real Moog, yeah. you know, made by the Moog man, you know, the mm-hmm. real SP-12, you know, the real stuff, you know, the, uh, it, 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 it was the real thing. Yeah. And I was fortunate to be able to learn excellence simultaneously as working in the gutter with these boys making this, these records, these hits, you know, so that when we, when I had to create that studio environment for them and book these sessions for them, I knew what to ask for because I was learning the read way of doing it. Mm. And it was par excellence. The best of the best. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was the, 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 the bar that was set. Mm-hmm. That was best. set on how to record records in Atlanta. And for them to be accepted commercially, commercially, to be deemed commercially and technically acceptable, which is a contractual term in an agreement, that mm-hmm. a label will will accept your record upon that condition, Dang. that it be commercially, ex- technically, technically and commercially, and commercially acceptable. Acceptable. 
Mm-hmm. That means there's no doubt about it. It's... That shit better sound good, and you better look good, and it better be some something I can sell. <laughs> That's what's up. That's crazy. So yeah, so it's really just about knowing the contract that you're setting up mm-hmm. and what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And these days, those contracts are null and void; like they're unacceptable. The contracts, the contracts that we grew up on in this business, they're unacceptable today. Mm. You know, because now this 360 deal, because now it goes back to that conversation of this 360 deal. Like, why are we, why are they drawing from my, my concert sales and my sponsorships right. and my marketing and Merch my children? And like, you know, <laughs> they want, the, they want my dog shit. You know, they want everything. Like, you know, <laughs> they, yeah. you know, they want a piece of everything I do. You know, they want, they want rights over my name and likeness which is also in every record company agreement as well for an artist Mm. you know they want they want rights to who you they want your they want to to buy you your name and likeness is theirs in perpetuity that's another word people got to look out for in their contract the the p word yeah when i saw that for the first time i was like wait (laughs) What, what is this if now if y'all don't know what perpetuity mean, y'all better GTS Google that shit because when it comes up in your contract, that means forever, forever, ever, forever, forever ever, ever. Yeah. ever. and it's normally not forever in your favor. That means you giving up something for the rest of your life. Yeah, forever, <laughs> even after you go. And after you're gone, your heirs can't have rights to your shit no more. Yeah. If perpetuity is in front or behind of anything or in any sentence or something that you're doing, you better examine that shit closely. Yeah. That's all I got to say. Yeah. Because yeah. they taking something from you. Yeah. It's... They coming for you. Yeah, that's that's crazy. But yeah, mm-hmm. I've definitely seen that in a few contracts. Yeah, you have. <laughs> yeah. You better cross that shit out. Yeah, for a like period that. of time to which to be determined. <laughs> yeah. 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 And you can just put that and call it a day. Like, it ain't going to be forever. We'll figure it out later. But it ain't going to be for fucking ever. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. No. Nope. What well, do you a think period about of this? time, TBD. <laughs> right. What do you think about this? these new services that are um, offering to buy, like, these indie catalogs and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, they're out there. They've always been out there. Um, a friend of mine named Richard Perna, who's probably one of the richest men in publishing out here, it does that. You know, he buys up catalogs. He buys up publishing. Publishing is a dirty game. Michael Jackson was the king of publishing. Man, I just saw an article yesterday that said he uh, bought Eminem's publishing. I did not yeah, know Eminem that. Eminem was talking shit. So yeah. he's like, I'm gonna buy your fucking records, boy. And now we're gonna see who's gonna be talking that shit. Um, Michael, whatever his name is, Marshall Matthews. Marshall. Yeah, little Marshall. Marshall. I'm just gonna buy your records, Marshall. I said, talking man, all that shit. Mike was gangster, man. He just bought yeah. his catalog. Like, oh, okay, you wanna mention me? <laughs> Look at this. Michael Jackson owned the Beatles catalog. Yeah, the Beatles. He just, yeah, that's. He was the king. Y'all thought this this ass was the king of pop. Michael Jackson was the king of publishing. Yeah. Didn't he have some of Elvis? Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> he was the king of publishing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, Michael. Yes. <laughs> little blanket, little blanket is a rich little baby. Yeah. Blanket yeah, he got ain't some no money. baby no more. He gotta be. <laughs> he ready. <laughs> Blanket straight. I'm going to put it like that. Yeah, Blanket, he's good. All the kids, they straight. Yeah. Oh, they daddy on some records. Right, right. And he, man, that's what I'm saying. Like, Mike, they say he owned, like, a piece of everybody at Sony. That Yeah, and they and that's they say that's why he, he's got to hear. What? Why he's not here no more. That's part of the quote-unquote conspiracy. Because he just owned a little bit too much of the wrong person shit. Man. That's a so dirty they, game. So they say. They say. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. a dirty game. I definitely heard 
Dick Gregory talk about different stuff with Michael Jackson. And I'm like, yo, who knows? Who knows? I know that um, when you start playing with people's money, anything can happen. Yeah. Anything yeah. Can happen. Yeah. Um, I know what else I wanted to ask you, too. Like, because I know that you, like, I remember the dungeon the dungeon family was hitting hard like from 94 to at least 97 8 mm-hmm. and during that time Tupac and Biggie was both killed i wanted yeah. to ask you like being in the like industry and and actually selling records and stuff at that time like did it did it have like a big effect on like what was going on at the time or did it affect y'all at all like how how what what was that like to be from the south because that's the difference it's like it was an east coast west coast thing and then then the south was in the middle right yeah so i mean it didn't affect us directly you know, in terms of us, how we did our business, us making our money, um, I would say it was more of an emotional effect, mm. you know, because we were neutral. You know, they were cool with Biggie and they was cool with Pop, mm. you know, so, you know, we was cool with Puffy and that whole camp, mm. you know, so. Because Puffy shot the first Outcast video. The Outcast, man, Outcast video. Yeah, so for that to happen in the industry in in which we were coming of, you know, getting getting out coming into our who we were, you know, in, into into prominence, I should say, um, it was hard because you didn't know, you know, you you knew it was something between them, you know, it wasn't a east, it wasn't a southern thing. You know, it was an East Coast, West Coast thing. And, you know, we still had to prove ourselves and make a name for the South in this. And as the East and the West were battling, busy battling, the South kind of wiggled its way through and rose to the top. You know, that's when we saw our best days, when they was busy fighting. Really? I mean, that's how I look at it. You know, you got this all this other stuff going on. You know, the the, the energy is clear. Like the energy, there's a clear block that gave us a path through. Because mm. we wasn't involved in none of that shit. Yeah, it was like no attachment at all, really. I at mean, all, you yeah. know. And it wasn't just for us. You can look at the Ghetto Boys. You can look at, you know, what was happening with Eight Ball and MJG. You know, Memphis Rose. You know. The Florida, Luke and them, you know, it wasn't just Atlanta. It was the South as a whole. Mm, yeah. You know, we New all we had, we really had a time to shine from Houston and UGK, you know, and, and, and Ghetto Boys and all of us, you know. Yeah, yeah definitely. The Master P and them, all of us. Every, the South, the whole South Coast lit up. Mm. I know, it was all at the same time, too. It was like a chain reaction. You had Atlanta popping off, then you had doggone Texas popping off. You got Houston popping off. You got doggone Miami popping off. <laughs> you know, yeah. you got Memphis doing a little thing up there with doggone uh, uh what's the boy name? The 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 triple six mafia and them, crunchy black and them, crunchy and black Paul and... Mike, Paul Wall mm-hmm. and them. You know, mm-hmm. it was just a lot of different things happening for a lot of. You know, for great Mississippi was popping a little bit. David Banner and them emerged out of the ashes. I mean, it was just a beautiful whole Southern emergence over a period of time. Right. That's crazy. And it's kind of like, I I mean, in my mind, it feels like y'all touched all of it because I don't, I can't think of many people that did not, if you came to Atlanta, you came to the dungeon. Yeah. You're right. And then there was a time when you would go, I remember when we started traveling and going and doing music other places and, and having to go to other cities. Mm-hmm. You know, at first you wouldn't hear Southern shit on the radio when you was in Cali or you was in New York. Then suddenly 
all of a sudden you fly into New York and turn on the radio station, you start to hear Southern records. You know, or you go to LA, uh, you not you hearing Southern records. Yeah. Like Atlanta's popping in these other cities. Yeah. And you're like, dang, we really that's when it spread and we knew like when you could fly out and hear your records on the radio. Yeah, that's especially in New York or LA. Yeah. You're like, dang! And then when Rico had that billboard, remember when Rico had that billboard on Times Square? Man, you couldn't tell us nothing. And then you doggone go into doggone the gap and waterfalls is playing, you know, right. in the damn now yeah. that's, you know, that's, man, it was like on yeah. top, like top of the world. Like, that's crazy. And mm-hmm. all that come from just grinding. Grinding. <laughs> just grinding. grinding. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, building a family, building a legacy. Yeah, yeah. And it's a it's a beautiful legacy. And you know, somebody asked me how I felt about it, and I'm like, I don't know how I feel about it because to me, that was just that's just my life. I lived it. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I lived by the beat like they lived check to check. If they didn't move their feet, and then we didn't. Eat. Eat. So we was all like neck to neck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, I just that was my life. Yeah. I, I don't I don't know anything else. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. That's how my kids grew up. They don't know nothing else right now. Like they so messed up like Malia out here doing directing music videos, you know, I'm out here rapping. <laughs> Sine out here, you know, doing films, doing music and writing and, you know, just my yeah. poor little Nene, <laughs> she's just so creative. She can't help herself. You know, I Do watch it. I watch them all. I see Malia doing her thing. I see E, Sine, mm-hmm. they all, all getting busy. And Hadassah, Hadassah's running from her calling. Hadassah can sing. Hadassah can rap. Hadassah can act. Hadassah can dance. Hadassah is a star, and she is just running from. She's like, I don't want to be out there like that. Isn't it? You know, people make me sick. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know what I want to do with my life. I'm like, I'm telling you, the reason why you don't want to do what you what you don't know what you want to do with your life is because you're running from your calling. You know, we hear Hadassah ha- rapping and singing in the dog or bathroom and stuff. It's her g- good, I mean, excellent, good. Like she just don't want to do it. She just hard headed. Yeah, maybe I. Uh... Maybe one day uh, we'll see, but she day. she's the one. She's the, she's our saving grace. She's our ticket out of here, and she's, she won't act right. She the one, and she don't want it. I've seen her dance. She get busy. <laughs> she get busy. Yeah, she get busy. <laughs> yeah, she she's, busy. she just don't want to fall in line, and and you know it's I call it hashtag hustle hustle. She don't want to do it. <laughs> she like y'all ain't hustling my ass. <laughs> I'm going to work at dog one Chick Fil A. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I was. I definitely. I was there. They all grew up right there in the mm-hmm. music, in the studio, mm-hmm. just there in the office. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's beautiful now that they're grown, because now you know they all hang together. Like I call Enum. I'm like Enum, where you at? Oh, I'm at the Rico House with Deuce and Ryder. Me and Sine. You know, we'll be back tomorrow. I mean, me and Hadassah. We'll be back tomorrow, or maybe the next day. Yeah, I'm son's like, birthday just passed. He was with Reed. <laughs> he was over there with Rico. That thing was so funny. I was on live with them. Like I was, they had me on like that Facetime. You know, how you can Facetime with like three or four people now. Uh-huh. So I'm on Facetime with Rico and Enum. Enum is in Rico's living room, shaking up a bottle of Boob Cleclo. Not, not no Andre. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got a two hundred and fifty dollar bottle of champagne. He in there trying to open it, and he's like, "Well, let me just shake it up." All you see is Rico go. (laughs) (laughs) What this nigga doing? Why? What are you? (laughs) (laughs) That shit was so funny. He's like, "Hold on, hold on, hold on." He done let he left the chair. (laughs) Man. Ran upstairs, but it, you know you they they live such good lives. Yeah. They do. 
Yeah, they have great lives. And now that they're all grown and they're together, and it ain't nothing that we have to force. You know, it's a beautiful thing, especially for the boys. You know, those boys, they those boys and Hadassah <laughs> uh-huh. are thick. They, they close. Like, you can't you can't tell them about each other. The yeah. best they cousins, and ain't nothing you can do about it. Right. Right. And they either they're going to be over here eating up everything, or they, they're going to be at Rico House eating up everything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's beautiful. come together you know what i mean effortless yeah, you know you effortless. and with love and just i mean even to see like your whole kids like me and the kids got a family group chat like it's me all the kids rashad even damn miles and Kalia are in the group chat with us mm-hmm. and that should be so funny <laughs> <For real? laughs> they be dropping videos and memes but it's just beautiful to see the togetherness of these children yeah yeah, and how they've all grown up together and, and made it through some really tough times and their resilience and, you know, just had the coolness of them all, their own ex- distinct individuality, mm-hmm. their interests, they've you know. Been, they've been who they were since birth, all of them. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. All yeah. Of them. But the beautiful thing is that the, is the love they share, uh-huh. the, the true love that all them kids share. Yeah. You know. And that, and that makes all of this worth it. Every 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 struggle that we've had, every you know tear, every worry, every dime, is worth it to see them kids happy and growing up and and being together. Yeah, yeah. Because this, this you know when, when all, they, pray, yeah when they go you know that's mm-hmm. that's 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 their legacy. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> when they transition, this is left to those kids. And, you know, I was talking to them the other day, and I was like, do you, I said, I don't even think y'all fathom what you're, you you stand to inherit. You know, I'm like, think about what your dad does every day for the past, however long you've known him, 25, 30 years, every day he's gotten up, gone to the studio, made beats all day long. Yeah. All day long. Most of them have never even seen the light of day. Nope, he just archives them. Archives them. I'm like, you have a treasure trove. It's like owning a city. It's like owning a, a, a owning continents <laughs> of houses. You know, like mm-hmm. I don't even think they comprehend what is still going on to this day. You know, and that's one of the reasons. Like, I was like, I need one of y'all to be a lawyer up in this bitch because y'all got some shit. <laughs> right. because it. that's the thing like it's all I think that's what it's about right now is how we can um, reclaim our I guess the worth in our heart you know what I mean mm-hmm. like in the music because like you said it was based on records and, mm-hmm. and they it's were able to records. establish that now that's all outdated we have a new system I think that this is a time when we can decide how we want it to go from here. Right, but there's other things. Like, there's still publishing. Publishing is still a real thing. Like, there's still always going to be a need for music. If it's for marketing for commercials, mm-hmm. if it's for licensing for movies mm-hmm. and television, um, licensing for artists, you know, for apps, you know, mm-hmm. for the internet. There's, there's, it's always evolving. So although, yeah, that day of selling a record at a whole, of getting paid off of a $9.99 wholesale rate on a record, that day is gone. It's over. Mm -hmm. All we can do is look to the new ways of monetizing this music, Mm -hmm. new ways of finding value in these, in this, in these compositions, Mm -hmm. because this is these are our children's inheritance, and I think about that all the time, you know. And I need for them, I need for them to take interest in it some kind of way, because it's going to be their intellectual property that is inherited to them, just like Michael Jackson's children and Prince's sister, you right. know. <laughs> right. 
You know, they she just, got she got a whole house and a museum, and you see the cool shit she doing. She putting out Prince albums. Think about twenty years from now. You know, unreleased vintage. You know, organized noise tracks that have never been heard. <laughs> you know, because for you to rap on. Yeah. To, for as on the lease, you know, you can lease these records. You can, you know, we can, just it's so many. I can't even imagine the ways in which these kids are going to have to monetize the the the, right, the intellectual property that they're going to be inherited. Right, right. That's but they're going to have to have the form with all the the want to know. Mm-hmm. Somebody got to you got to send one of these kids out of all. 12, 13, 14, how many kids Rico, Pat, and Ray got collectively now? About 25? You know, one of them A lot. <laughs> yeah, oh, I don't know. Yeah, Somebody yeah. got to figure it out and yeah. be the steward of it mm-hmm. and make sure that it's fairly managed for them all. Because it's going to go to their children, to their children, to their children. And right now, you know, as we thought about what was happening in the now, like, I think about what's happening what we're leaving for our, our generations to come. Mm-hmm. Like we, we're, we're going to be the ancestors at some point, you know, at, at the, and for the next, you know, we have a foundation that we have to lay for those that come after us, mm-hmm. you know? So I'm thinking about not just my children, but their children and their children and their children's children. Right. You know, if this foundation is laid properly, none of these kids will ever have to work again. They will always have something of value that is passed down to them mm-hmm. from their fathers. Mm-hmm. And that's where my head is at. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know what, what everybody else is thinking about <laughs> when it comes to, you know, our future and our planet and our legacy and our children and, you know, our us as adults, you know, what we should be doing. We're in our 50s now. Like, it's time for niggas to get some damn sense and think about what's, think about the future and what's ahead. Mm-hmm. 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 That's deep. That's deep. Because that's what it's worth. That's what, that's what it's about. Mm-hmm. We see other mm-hmm. people eat off of their children, eat off of their legacies, off of their catalogs, off of the music that they put out. And it's, mm-hmm. That's what we in it for, right? That's what, why else am I here? <laughs> yeah, that's what we in But to for, create the universe, yeah, to create the universe in which my children are going to live. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we all living in this, we live in a universe together. Like we all, we all came up together, you know, and I'm sorry that your interview has gotten a lot personal, <laughs> but, you know, we're a part of a world, you know, mm-hmm. and we have children that we're responsible for. You know, that are going to grow up and be adults together. Just like we're adults right now. Yeah. You know, yeah. our kids are going to be relating like that when we're gone. Mm-hmm. And their kids are going to be relating like that. Yeah. Their relatives, they're going to relate. <laughs> <laughs> and be in relationship with each other. Mm-hmm. You know? And it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Well, the, the the theory is that if they don't have to worry about the struggle, then they ha- and they have the you know the resources. It's no telling what they could do from there. Mm-hmm. You know, what I mean? just yeah, just like they, our parents was thinking, ain't no telling what they gonna do, but we but we gonna do right. Uh, my grandparents had no idea the internet was going to be out here popping like this. Yeah, nobody <laughs> knew. <laughs> nobody knew. That we was going to be talking face-to-face, doing an interview that millions of people have the potential to see. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That technology was not in the in the thought process of our predecessors. predecessors. Right, right. But it's so what's now. to come for our children and their children are not even in our thought process right now. We can't think that far. You know, you can only imagine what they're going to see, but, you know, yeah, so what yeah. we lay down for them now is is going to be the foundation that can help them, you know, go out into that world and be fruitful and be productive and not have to worry about things that we've had to worry about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's, that's a fact. That's a fact. Um, I 
know what else I wanted to ask you. In 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 all of the in all of the projects that you have uh, been a part of, right? One, what was your what do you think was your favorite? Maybe Kilo. <laughs> Kilo, for real? The organized, organized space? space? Organized space and Kilo. Yes. Working with King James and, 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 and uh, oh my gosh, DJ Taz and, you know, DJ Red and seeing, you know, that, because to me, Kilo was a legend. Like, uh-huh. you know, I grew up with, do you hear what I hear? That boom, that boom. Yeah. I like that, but I don't that guy. You know, so when we signed Kilo, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> "Yeah, I get to do a record with Kilo." <laughs> That's hard. So for me, yeah. But then, you know, on the real, I want to say also Curtis Mayfield. Yeah. You know, yeah. we did the last record with Curtis Mayfield before he he passed on. Now it was uh, after here, his accident. But I'm gone, right? Here, but I'm gone. Here, but yeah. I'm gone. Yeah, records, yeah, and we had to, you know, he was paralyzed when he did that record. He hadn't, he that was the first record that he had recorded since he had had that accident. Mm-hmm. And the reason why it was so special to me is because I worked at Capitol when he had the accident. Oh, really? I was there. I remember the day it happened. He was he was one of our artists. We, I remember when he was in the hospital, we had this big old card that we had made for Curtis Mayfield, and everybody signed it all around the country, and we had it sent to the hospital. Like, I remember all of that that happened when I was working at Capitol. And then fast forward years later, you know, I, you know, for, you know first we're working at his house at Kurtom on the Goody Mob record. So I'm like, oh, shit, we in Curtis Mayfield's house? You know, this is mm-hmm. son, it's Todd, I get to meet Todd, you know. Mm-hmm. We're working together, like, this shit is cool. And then, you know, we meet Carlos Glover. Carlos Glover is is, is Curtis Mayfield engineer. You know, these his people. We're working at Curtis Hall. We can go to Curtis' house, you know. And then we get to record this record with him. Like, yeah. you know, that, that I get to work with Curtis Mayfield's attorney. You know, he was cool. Me and Curtis Mayfield became friends. He would call me. What? You know, and I mean, yes, like I would be at the office on Ralph McGill and he'd be like, hey, baby. <laughs> For real, just hit you up? Like, what's yes, happening? Yes, Curtis would just be hitting me up. Like, we going in the studio next week. You know, I just <laughs> want to know because, you know. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, this is nice, Oh, my gosh. Oh, like, that's. We became friends, wow. like. He would call me and talk to me, like for yeah. real. And I would go to the studio, like, and see him. And he would have to, they would have to bring in, like, a gurney of sorts mm-hmm. for him to record. And it would be tilted so that he was hanging kind of invertedly upside down in order to sing because his vocal cords were kind of paralyzed. And in order for him to relieve his vocal oh, cords, to it kind of. Like, Make it looser for him to be able to. Mm-hmm. So if he if we, he had to record upside down, like at an angle, with his head tilted down and his feet up, and we had to set that up when he had for him when he went in the studio. Yeah, that's wow. That's why. See, that's stuff I would never have known that. Like I can't even. That's mm, that's determination. Yeah. yeah, and then we recorded that record, and then, and then that Christmas he died. And I remember being at Pat's house for Christmas Eve, Christmas Day. Then a, the, we the Pat's wife used to have this big Christmas Day meal, and we would bring all the kids over. All of the families would be together. You know, all the wives, all the kids, all the guys. You know, they'd be down in the basement playing pool, getting drunk, like just having a great dungeon family time. And we got the news that Curtis passed. On Christmas, mm-hmm. 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 I remember that vividly. We were at Pat's house. I remember that. Yeah, that had to be devastating. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. How was it at the label when, when the accident happened? That was. Oh, that was devastating too because he was in concert and a and a, a light fixture fell on him. Wind blew. He was at a concert somewhere I can't remember where, and wind blew a light trellis on him. Uh, it was like a like just a fluke accident. Mhm. Yeah, he was at an outdoor concert, and the lights just fell down on him. So, okay, then the other thing I would have to ask you is, because I'm looking at it like, you know, y'all were in the business of selling records. So I know everybody was cool, but it's still competitive at the same time, right? Mm-hmm. I wanted to know how competitive were was it really between like organized noise when when it was a label versus like bad boy? Mm, I don't really kind of know what you getting at. Well, I've heard I've heard stories that it was a back and forth thing. Like they were trying, like like Puffy was kind of driven to outsell specifically like outcast and outcast was that was their competitors like in order to stay number one they had to compete with the bat with bad boy you know what i mean i mean well we all kind of had to compete with them crews but i you know i don't really know that that too much you know i didn't really have to have to get into that my job was making sure them records got done you know uh, okay okay you know, so you so, wasn't if, you didn't yeah, see like, if it was like a, cause I just wanted to know how like, cause especially knowing how competitive like a puff like Puffy is with yeah, everything, yeah. I wanted to know like in that moment where everything was just crunch time, you had the height of like kind of the hit like like to me that's when rap music started selling like to a yeah. level where it was like okay, it's not just something that's like a little kitty street music now this is like number one mainstream genre urban right. music you know right. what i mean right so from my perspective again it went back to the making of the records and mm-hmm. what we had to do our challenge was making sure that that music was up to par and once you create a hit record now the challenge is is coming back and creating something better than the hit record so for us, it wasn't necessarily competing with Puffy or some of these other outside entities. For us, it, for me, from a sonically sound and commercially and technically acceptable perspective, we was competing with ourselves. You know, we had to make sure that the, the, the record, the next every record that we did was better than the last one that we produced. And that shit got hard after a certain time and became challenging. Mm. So, you know, yeah, there was a lot of other external stuff going on, but my focus was purely internal in terms of making sure that we had quality, con- quality control was my biggest concern and making sure that we had exceptional product for the labels to market, to hand over for Shanti to market and make them package pretty and, and have something to sell. Something for LA to be twirling around in the studio and oh yeah, this you know, you know, something for him to be calling puppy. I got this, you know. That gotcha. was that was our job. That yeah. was my job was to be called and to be like the record's done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. And knowing that we can sit back and know that they're gonna be listening to it and their heads are gonna be blown off. Mm. That was my concern. It wasn't what was going on around me outside, it was what was going on inside. And making sure that that music and that product was was up to par. So and you did that not by comparing it to what anybody else is doing but by comparing it to what we was were the already standard doing for what y'all had did already. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cause Goody Mob couldn't come out sounding like another outcast. Mm-hmm. You know, 
when we did dog on standing uh still standing we had to we had to do so we had to do better than soul food soul food was one of the best records ever made <laughs> right. do, you, do you redo something better than the best record ever made yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah. Southern Playlist was the other best record ever made. Yeah. How do you go back and top that with a record better than that? And right. then Elevators was the best record ever made. How do you come back and fix it, the it, A.T. Elliott's was the best record ever made? You I know? remember when that, it was all, to me, it was always when you listen to it for the first time from start to end together. that's when it was like and the okay. sequence is right yeah you know and for us that might be 10 or 12 sessions until we get the sequence perfect mm-hmm. until we get the order right and which these records are gonna go to make that impact for people to be like oh my god you know, like this yeah. record is a banger and it all the the sequence of the records makes a difference people don't realize that the order in which you put them records in determines how you're gonna react to them yep yep and that's what I miss now. It's hard to find those albums that's like... Because they nobody making albums no nope. more. They don't take the time to put them together. Nope. They don't do five or six, six different sequences and live with them and then be like, no, 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 we got to take that one out, put that in. You know, mm-mm, that record don't work no more. Just get that record from three weeks ago or, or two. <laughs> Mix that and put that in with this and see how it sounds. You know, they don't know that. Yeah. Because the, there's no value in, in compiling an album anymore mm-hmm. to that pers- to that perspective. Yeah, because I know the first time I heard something like Southern Playalistic or like those albums back then, they played out like movies. Like, Lil Will's album! Yeah, oh. it was like a movie. Yeah. Somebody got like a dog on a movie. Mm-hmm. I mean, and there's an art to sequencing them records. You get an engineer just to sequence the records with you, you know? Yeah. It's the art to it. Yeah, yeah. It is. It Um, got to be be done right. Yeah, so the quality control was my biggest concern. And, and, you know, when every record you do is the best record ever made, you got to do better than that, you know? (laughs) So at some point, you're just like, dang, you know? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Wow, that's crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. doctor got to be different from Cool Breeze? Cool Breeze got to be different from Black Backbone, you know? Mm-hmm. It just, it, you know, and they're all on different labels. Right. So that was the other thing that started happening, too, is like we got fragmented because the one thing that we didn't have was everybody signed to the same label. Mm-hmm. We got all these artists on all these different labels, and all these different labels are competing with each other, mm-hmm. which in turn caused the artists to have to compete with each other. Right. Which was something unnatural for them because they're used to being together. When you they know? stayed together, even in competition with, even with it the was hard system. though. Yeah, it was hard though because we had to negotiate, you know, those types of things where they could co-promote when they were actually really supposed to be competitors. You got a Goody Mob and an Outcast record on the charts at the same time on two different labels, and it's like, what the fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't want them both to win, you know, like. Yeah, yeah. But you got one label over here being like, "We want number one," and you got, you got this one over here trying to sell an Outkast record on, you know, this team over here promoting Outkast, this team promoting Goody Mob, you know, and now they clashing because yeah. you both want the number one spot. Yeah. To me, that's the mistake we made was having them all on different labels. We should have just had one big label and had everybody on it. But then it, that wasn't. I don't even know when you when y'all started. It wasn't a lot of people with labels yet, right? It was. Like, it wasn't a lot of people with labels. Mm-mm. Yeah, it was like a more of a production kind of deal and mm-hmm. and artist yep. deal, direct artist deals and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yep. that's, that's crazy. So, do you feel like you had a you played a part in kind of writing the script for how the next uh, like decade of music business was done? I do. I mean, I do in a collective sense with a whole lot of people. You know, you had, it wasn't just the dungeon. Mm-hmm. You know, you had So So Deaf. Mm-hmm. You had DTP. You know, you had different camps out here that were making just as much an impact as we were. You know, so it was a collective writing of the laws, of the rules, and the laying of the land. Mm-hmm. 
you know, that, that made us all um, collaborate to, to, to lay the foundation for what is what we call the new Atlanta, you know, and in that, you know, you, you, you breed, you, you just, you try to breed and, 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 and cultivate the next, the next. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. Cause to me, that's, I call it, that's like the goat era of Atlanta. It was like, so so deaf. It was Dallas. It was mm-hmm. uh, the, the dungeon. Yeah, the dungeon. Yeah. And um, that was kind of it as far as hip hop, right? Mm-hmm. I think so. I think disturbing the peace. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't want to name and them. And then at yet. some point you had uh you had blocking them that came out. You know that was later on. Yep, because Ti yeah. and I, I will I will put Ti and Luda in the same class, like mm-hmm. Grand Hustle and Disturbing the Peace. They were the next generation. Mm-hmm. The you know? next class that came through. And, and then you had the black the the what BME. BME and then mm-hmm. uh, Jazzy Faye too. Jazzy. Faye. Yep, and then um, BME. So BME is like Lil John and them, right? Yep. Yeah, black okay. market. And, and then and you had the added crew in them, which is kind of part of the dungeon, but not really, but it's like kind of sort of. And then you had Noonie in them. You had Noontime. Noontime, yeah. Yeah, you had a lot of stuff that was going on out here. In Atlanta. That's the indie game started jumping. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. It was popping out here for a minute. Like, it was crazy. Mm-hmm. But it was a beautiful time. Yeah. Yep. A beautiful time to make music. And I'm so glad and so fortunate to have experienced it, to, to be a part of its development, to be witness to its transformation, you know, and and, and to really have played a, a role in it, to, to have part in establishing the foundation. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, yeah. And and to be a part of the future and, you know, honored to have young artists now that I look up to, like, you know, my, my babies, my, my babies right now is, um, I don't know if you know Brandon Phillips Taylor and Devontae Hitchcock, Deontay Hitchcock. Mm-mm. Oh, man. Deontay Hitchcock is a beast out here. And his producer, Brandon, I took him to the studio for his very first time in his life when he, as a, as a high schooler. Yeah. And he's one of the top up and coming producers right now. They just did a, a writer's camp with it's Issa Ray with HBO. Um, Netflix, all kind of stuff. They're doing all kind of stuff. Deontay Hitchcock, you got to check him out. Yeah, he's, he's, I'm definitely going to look him up. Yeah, I'll send you a link. Okay. This boy is ridiculous. His freestyles are dumb. Yeah. And he's killing the game right now. That's what's up. That's what's up. Yeah, yeah. So, Hero the Band, you know, like, to, to have young artists, you know, Nisha Nice, you know, that, yeah. that, Look I up did. to me, like, their music. I, I I checked out Nisha Nice at a um a TV show. It was it was like a TV show they were taping. Mm-hmm. And, uh, she performed a couple other artists too, but um I was invited out to see her. Yo, she is wow. Like her, I like her. The energy she has on stage Nisha and all of that. Man. Yeah, Nisha Nice is dope. Nisha's gonna be something else, and to you know, so to watch them develop and grow, like. I've been watching Nisha since like maybe 2015 or so, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so just to be a part of their growth and development, and and to be called Mama Didi, you know, to them, you know, or Mama Peaches, mm-hmm. you know, is is I honor. see how the how the young artists look up to you and they come like when they come, they look, they soak up game and, and oh yeah, move on, you know what I mean. I mean I even even dope. artists from other areas like Denzel Curry. I'm not sure if you up on Denzel Curry or not. Denzel, Cur- you. I think I've heard him. Not like really, really, but I think uh, Malia. Out of Miami. Have, I think Malia was sharing some stuff from him once. Denzel Curry is a beast. Maybe it was you. I'm not sure. I don't know if it was and he tours like he's an independent artist out of Miami. Mm-hmm. He tours. He just he opened for Billie Eilish. Really. Yeah, like they big on like they they big like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he mm-hmm. doing he doing Apple commercials now. He got music on Apple commercials now. Nice. And then yeah. that's the other thing too. Like um, 
I think it's dope that the music that was done back then, when that when when it was like not the nineties or whatever, mm-hmm. is still popping right now. Like one of my favorite commercials on TV right now is the Sleepy and 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 Gip with the stepping out. You know they got the uh, Spotify commercial. Oh wow! Yeah, I love that man. Just the way it come on with the animation, I'm like, that's dope, man. That's so dope. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, but, yeah. That's uh, when you know you've done stuff, and and music lives on forever. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the one thing. Music is the if you if you lay it, lay down the right keys, it's gonna be there forever. Right. Right. Great song will never die. That's true. That's true. It will be forever. Mm-hmm. And we have that. We have that um, uh, several times over. Within our within our catalog, mm-hmm. got the time for it though. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's an absolute fact. But the fact that you was there to be able to, um, because without knowing how to do the paperwork, get the business done. Man, <laughs> I can remember future when y'all used in your era, your era of being in the dungeon. I, we was trying to get Future signed up with BMI. He would never sign his papers. I forged Future's BMI papers for him. <laughs> you might have forged mine too, because I remember y'all was trying to get me to sign. I don't think I, don't... I, probably, I, think I signed all y'all damn BMI papers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know I forged Future's because I went down there. I went to the BMI Awards one year when he was the number one. He got the number one award for having the number being the no, highest bill, writer for Billboard. Uh-huh. And I went down there. I strutted my so he was sitting in the front row. Yeah. And I took my drunk ass down. I was drunk as hell. <laughs> <laughs> I was like Nevadius. And he was like, Mama Diddy. <laughs> and he was like, Mama, this Diddy, she my everything. Like, I don't know where I would be without Diddy, Mama. Like, Diddy, he just hugged me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, everybody. I just, I just said, I said, I just wanted to tell you, I love you, nobody is, and I'm so proud of you. He was like, I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> and I, then I just walked away and left. <laughs> I know everybody was like, what the fuck going on? Because I walked my ass right down there to the front row with a whole damn arena. <laughs> For real. That's... <laughs> Yeah, we was y'all all would over not the place. Do what I said. Y'all was hard headed. <laughs> we was all over the place. I, I I just remember you telling me about it. I don't remember. So I think they was. So you just showed them to me. Like, look, this is what it is. is what it say. <laughs> <laughs> this is what it is. <laughs> yeah. I said, all right, that's cool. If you say we good, we good. <laughs> <laughs> like, I had what? files on everybody. Like I had everybody uh, driver's license, social security, uh-huh. uh, everything. I had files on every single person from the musicians to the artists so that in case people needed something, mm-hmm. I didn't have to come go bothering and looking for nothing. I just had, I had a little file up under my desk, plastic yeah. band. It was waterproof. I'm like, yeah, this I has remember. to stay with me. Yeah, because I remember I'm, I I helped you set your office up downstairs in, on when we was out in Ellenwood. Uh huh. Yep, mm-hmm. and we had you had the file cabinets and all yeah. this stuff we took down in there. Yeah. Yeah, and under my desk was a plastic waterproof bin with a file on every person in the dungeon. Wow. Everybody. <laughs> your mama name. <laughs> Everything. Your, W two I nine W nine everything like. <laughs> Man, that's, that's official right there. I still probably got that that down in this basement right now. Yeah. I I know it's down in my basement right now. Wow, that's crazy. 
That's yep. like oh, all everybody. that stuff. Yep, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Dang, that's yep. rough. But that's real, man. Hey, I'm glad you came on here, man. I well, thank you for you inviting on, me. For real, this is this dope. This is fun. This is dope, yep. yeah. Um, I really, um, I really want to, um, maybe see if I can have you come on like sometime in the future as well okay. to um just kind of maybe go into some more stuff or whatever or like really my vision is that people that I've had on previously I would bring them on like maybe as more like a group chat and we'll discuss other topics you know what I mean like <laughs> um I had some people on like I'm having um my cousin Nick hopefully I've talked to him come on this weekend like sunday mm-hmm. and he just did that film that um that's on netflix uh don't get me to lying about the name of it uh i can't i always mess it up my mom was mad at me because she was like you telling me it was called something else um it's a it's a black film that was on netflix i don't want to mess okay. it up right now but anyway uh-huh. With you being in the industry, I would love to maybe have both of y'all come on in the future as a, you know what I mean, and we talk okay. about talk about this. Yeah, because my you know my life has taken a drastic turn. You know, with with life comes change. The only thing constant in life is change. Yeah, and I've been fortunate enough to take the skills that I've learned in music management mm-hmm. and apply them to you know a new career in film. And location management. And we didn't even talk about, I wanted to talk about the Murray Media Group, too. Mm-hmm, yeah, Media so. Group. Yeah, that's a whole yeah, other so, part. No, I just, it's just a lot. So, yeah, I'll come back on. We can keep this thing going. Yeah. Because be it's nice. a lot. It's a lot. And, you know, the only thing that I can say to anybody out here in this industry mm-hmm. is don't pigeonhole yourself to one thing. Try to learn as much as you can about whatever it is that you're interested in mm-hmm. because, you know, the one thing that I can say about my career is that whatever my interests were specifically in music, you know, my my career followed my interests. Mm-hmm. You know, I was always able to be like, man, I want to learn how to do this and and find myself in those positions. And even now to where, you know, embarking upon a music and a, a, a career in film, you know, I can remember 10 years ago being like, man, I want to work. I want to do that. You know, I want to be out there on them, on them sets, you yeah, know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and now I'm out here on them sets, you know? Dumb. So, you know, it's, I have a dream it and do it mentality mm-hmm. and anything that I say I want to do, I know that I'm capable of, of doing it. And if I can do it, so can you or anyone else out there. Mm-hmm. It just takes persistence and tenacity and interest, you know, and work, Right. you know, you can, you can, you can manifest your destiny. But it's up to you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't be sitting around here saying, I want to do something and not put in the work to get it done. You know, you make the right connections. You continue to push forward. You can do whatever it is that you want to do. Yeah. I'm living proof of that. Because anything that I've ever wanted to do, I've found myself doing it. Right. Right. That's dope. <laughs> That's not, that's what makes it an amazing story. I'm telling you, it's dope. Word, that's yeah. what's up. So I really appreciate it. I'm definitely going to have you come back on in the future. All right, kid. We'll get it in. I, I right. want to thank you again. And I'm going to upload this probably tomorrow if you want to watch it. But, you know what I mean? I okay. Have, like, clips and stuff up, too. You know what I mean? All right. Well, you know I love you. I love you, too, Didi. All right. Thank you. All right. I'll talk to you right. soon. Word. Yo, that was dope. Let me switch my scene. Bam. But yeah, man, that was dope. Um, I could talk Didi, you know, forever. Of course, I was trying to keep it like on my journalism, journalism, but um. You know what I mean? I guess if you can't tell by now, we're obviously family. She's a uh, mother to my cousin. She was married to my first cousin. And, of course, whatever. If you know my story, you know the story. But I wanted, that's dope that I had. To, I was able to get Dee Dee to come on here and, and talk 
from her side because even being right there with it, I never really knew. Like, I mean, I know, I know, but you don't know. You know what I mean? It's kind of like how uh, you might know your mother works at the bank, but you don't know what she does specifically. You know what I mean? You just know she works at the bank. So it was kind of like that. But, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's dope, man. I hope that um, whoever watching this or everybody out there that y'all enjoyed it, Man, please make sure you remember to hit the like button, share it, whatever. Um, because I know that even in this um, short period of time that we was able to have her on here, that she dropped game, that anybody out there trying to do music, trying to get into the game, want to know how this was made, or maybe even just a fan of the music, you, you had to have picked up stuff in that so um yeah make sure you hit that like button share the video stink new side street kid it's the effing you know what i mean stream some music you heard us talking about how you know what i mean artists get paid off the streams so you know what i mean i got music up y'all already know me y'all stream my music but share it you know what i mean share it stream it more whatever you know whatever enjoy it but anyway, I'm out. Till next time. Side Street Kid. Don't give me the beast Then you get that chef I see I'll be your green like a vegan I'm black and I'm proud on James Brown Just thinking out loud like Ed Sheeran No hero, just me so I talk suit like me so And back it up like freak so Leave me be or things blow I am the pinnacle mini Come mini go brag about selling the run of a mini Go all as they sing to do and sell a drum to Thinking they gon' catch me sleeping But they'll never catch me though It's the F that ain't no question